Okay. Off we go, Laura. Awesome. Technology has come a long way. As you may know, we have many choices to make our home green and save on our energy bills. Always a popular topic, right? I know around my dinner table it is. Solar energy, heat pumps, and better insulation. Where do you even get started, right? As homeowners, we know all of these upgrades cost money. You know, the air conditioner or the heat pump gives us comfort in both winter and summer. The insulation is kind of one of those, you know, it makes a huge difference, but no one sees it. You spend all that money, but you don't see it, but you sure feel it. So our guest speakers will break it down to you today. So we're really excited to be here with Rick Martin and Bruce Moss. I'm going to first start off by telling you a little bit about Rick Martin, um, because honestly, I knew I know Rick and I didn't know all these cool things about him. So Rick Martin is an energy advisor with Energy View. He loves to translate the complex and technical world of energy upgrades into something more tangible. He likes energy saving solutions for homeowners. And that's really what he's super passionate about. After working in the technology consulting industry for years, Rick saw the potential to make a real difference in the world by addressing carbon emissions for residential homeowners in Canada. This is really cool, right? So he became a certified he became certified by Natural Resources Canada to perform home energy assessments. And now he spends his days helping Vancouver Island homeowners improve their energy efficiencies in their home. He is based out of the Comox Valley and he appreciates being able to combine his energy, his interest in numbers, people and the environment in his work. How great is that? Something you're passionate about, but also you have got great knowledge in. So say hello, Rick, and we'll move on to introducing Bruce. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Rick. We're so grateful to be have you here with us today. Thank you. It's good to, good to be here. Good to see everyone. Perfect. Okay, so next on to Bruce. Bruce is a master electrician with Sun Solar. I just thought he was a solar guy. I didn't know he had all these fancy skills as well. He was got enthralled in solar energy when his father became an early adapter of the technology. So this goes back more than one generation, which is crazy cool. After working in a few different settings, he became a father of two young children, and Bruce started his solar business to promote a greener future for the next generation. Um, often working with homeowners, he wishes, to, often he's working with homeowners that wish to reduce their energy bills and do good for the planet. So there's a lot of common interests there. You know, they care about their energy consumption. They care about their footprint. So he enjoys educating them on the advancements and benefits of solar power which is really great. And after a long, after I guess he's been an, a Vancouver Islander his whole life, he currently lives in the Cowichan Valley. And when he's not working, you're going to find him on the rugby field. So we're super excited to have Bruce here today. Say hello, Bruce, and introduce yourself to everyone. Hi, guys. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Bruce Moss. I'm master electrician and the owner of Sun Solar located in Duncan and yeah just really excited to chat with everyone and share a bit of knowledge. Awesome okay so our goal today is to put these two wonderful gentlemen kind of on the hot spot a uh, hot seat as we would say and so we're going to kind of take it away with Rick first of all and um, I'm not sure Crystal if you can put both their pictures side by side um, can we make them both I guess, Rick, you could unmute yourself at the same time. So Rick, uh, we're gonna take it away today with what is a home energy assessment look like and why is it important to, why is this an important step before making any energy upgrades? Uh, okay, so, so I guess um, administratively, uh, there's, there's sort of, um, just to describe the process a bit administratively first, um, because the administrativeness of the whole thing does does impact us. Um, there's two assessments. There's a before assessment and an after assessment, if you like. So you get that initial assessment. You get your upgrade for your whatever you're going to get: a solar, a heat pump, insulation, as you say, 
um, and then you get a secondary assessment after the fact, and that's going to be what what sort of gets you access to rebates and all the rest of the, the free money we're talking about here. Um, uh, so so that timing is really important. You can't do you 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 won't get your rebates um, if you don't get the, or the that initial assessment um, um, done um, upfront. Um, so so from an assessment perspective. Um, the, the assessment isn't strictly speaking focused on the rebates or the incentives. It's like a, a, an all up assessment of your home. Um, uh, it it uh, looks at your home through two different lenses. So um, um, firstly, the building envelope. So how well your home is retaining heat or retaining nice cool air in the summer. Um, and then how effectively um, you're filling it with heat um, and how efficiently you're getting that, that heat filled in. So you can think about it like, um, like sort of your, um, the, the way I think about homes is um, you get your building envelope performing. So good walls, good windows, good insulation, um, not many air, not many um, holes in the walls, that sort of thing. And then you fill it with cheap heat. Um, so you um, fill it with cheap heat, like through a heat pump or a really efficient furnace um, or, or what have you. Um, uh, so that's sort of the, the, the way to think about this. Um, it, so it's, a, it's an all-up assessment of your home, but through the lens of, of energy consumption and, and uh, energy, uh, energy usage and, and emissions and, and, and sort of from a carbon perspective as well. Well, when you told me that, Rick, I thought of a piece of Swiss cheese. <laughs> totally. And, and I thought, <laughs> hey, yeah, I had a whole a home. And many of us like have looked at homes over the years with all these imperfections, you know, windows that don't properly close, lack of insulation, draftiness, old windows, you name it, lack of insulation. Yeah, like you said, we turn around and we make it super warm, mm -hmm. but really we're not doing it justice. So it's like, you know, it's like we get the car painted, but we don't fix the inside of it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's really tempting. And I and I do see this periodically with my homeowners. You go for the big, exciting um, thing. You go with the big heat pump or because uh, it's cool. It's, it's like it, it's wicked. It's wicked technology. It, it, it's cheaper to run. Um, but if your home is that block of Swiss cheese, um, you, you're yeah, you're 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 making an improvement, but not quite. You could do better. Um, and if you and if you're able to fix your your building envelope, if you like, so get good windows, get good doors or it, or even simply just have a bit of extra insulation in your attic, um, your your heat pump is going to run more efficiently. And potentially you can even buy a slightly smaller heat pump because your home's working more efficiently. Um, so while it's so basically really it could be a trade off, basically, because if you can buy a smaller heat pump. You might save money there and it's kind of a catch 22. You, to you totally can. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a, there's really a priority in, a, in an ordering. I, I always advocate for building envelopes first and then get those, that cool heat pump or solar panels. Like um, solar panels is a sort of an unsung hero in all of this, like generating your own electricity, um, super valuable. Um, and that's a piece of the puzzle as well, um, for sure. Okay. Um, when we're talking about getting the energy audit done, the energy assessment, I know like if you can kind of break down for our group, because I went through it with you, can mm. you kind of break down to it like in a simple like one through five step, like, because I know I did my government application online, mm. you got involved. So can we just retract and kind of say here, if someone's taking notes on this call, which often people are, this is what you do. And this is the order. And this is kind of the timeline it takes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, um, so as as I've mentioned, that the ordering is really important here. So, assessment first. Um, so, before you get your heat pump or solar panels or your new windows, um, uh, get that assessment done first. And so, what that looks like is signing up for the Greener Homes program. Um, you can you can find that link online. Um, I'm sure we can put it in our chat here as well. Um, so, register for the program. Um, uh, th there's a few really simple eligibility criteria. You have to own your home. You have to be living in the home that in that home as well. So there's a few really simple administrative things. Once you've got that, you can engage uh, an energy advisor. Um, they'll come in and do that initial assessment, um, uh, and then uh, you'll get your upgrade. 
um, we can talk about the, the, the report from, from that assessment in a second. Um, then you'll get your, your upgrade or upgrades done. Once that's complete, um, then we do the second assessment. Um, and then collectively between myself and my, and my homeowners, um, you basically have to upload a bunch of that documentation up into the Greener Homes website. So it's really important. Keep your receipts as you go through the process. That's how you prove that you've paid um, for your heat pump or your solar panels or what have you. Um, so keep your receipts. You've got to upload all of that stuff at the end. There's a little bit of technical um, know-how needed to get through that process. It's not too, too bad. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, once you're finished, um, the government will send you um, either money for your, for your rebate. Um, and there's also that loan program out there, which maybe there's value, value in talking to as well um, um, for maybe for some of the bigger upgrades. Um, for, for windows or for, 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 um, for a heat pump or for solar panels that are getting a bit more pricey. So what are we seeing on average as the total rebate amount? Because I know, I think we saw it somewhere in the, about the 5,400 range. Was that correct? Oh yeah, good question. So from a rebate perspective, yeah, it, it, max, it, it maxes out at $5,600 um, for the okay. whole thing. Um, and then from a loan perspective, there's a new federal program um, where you can get up to $40,000 um, uh, interest-free loan from the federal government specifically for home upgrades. Um, now, you, you can't get that money and go spend it anywhere else. You've got to spend it on your home upgrades, yet on the solar panels or, or, or heat pump or what have you. Um, but, uh, but, but it's a bit of a game changer um, for a lot of my customers have been making some really good upgrades that, frankly, they wouldn't otherwise have been able to get to. Fantastic. Well, I look to look forward to exploring this option further because when I put some solar on my home, um, I think I'll take advantage of it. So, so Bruce, absolutely. let's put yeah. So Bruce, let's put you in the hot seat for, for next. Um, you also provide assessments before starting a solar project. Can you walk us through what that looks like and what information you would give homeowners and how it's a little bit different than what Rick does? Yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me. So generally, to start off. We look at the power consumption of the home. So we look at historical BC Hydro data and say, okay, you use, let's say, 16 megawatts annually. And then from that, we have a look at their roof and the age of their roof and say, does this make sense? Because that's always the first and foremost. We don't want to put solar on a roof that's going to need to be changed within the next five years because you're going to be tearing it off. Um, going forward from that point, we can give projections as to how much power your roof could actually generate being covered in solar panels, and then what that investment would look like from a return perspective. Okay, and there's a square footage ratio calculation, if I remember correct, when you did it, my... Exactly. So we'll base on the angle of your roof and the azimuth it's at, and based on the square footage available, um, there are some kind of break points for panels that are on the market, just sizing wise, we can get an idea of how much power we can put there. Great. And uh, Denise has got a really good question. What are your thoughts on sol solar technology? And is it worth waiting? Is it a a advancing constantly? Or is solar technology fairly stable? It's it more specific to shingles. I heard that they're making shingles into oh. solar. Okay. So they, they are. And I've seen them. I think if you were building a new home and money wasn't an object, it might be a neat option. Um, from a technology standpoint, it seems strange to me to combine the two um, for this sheer fact of roofs fail and technology fails faster generally. So you're, you're kind of putting two linchpins in a system that I don't know if they should go together. Um, hmm. But that that might be a bias on my point as I've used and been installing solar panels for six years and they make sense to me the way the current system is set up. And most people find them fairly aesthetically pleasing. Okay. And so when you're talking about different technology in solar, are there different types of solar panels or are you typically installing the same type of solar panel? So there are different types of solar panels. That being said, from a general perspective on most houses, we're using the same type of panels. If you go look at any 10 different contractors, 
the majority of us will be using the exact same panels. Um, there are some different applications such as bifacial panels where you might want to let light come through um, such as I've seen them on decks, I've seen them over carports where people want the light, um, but for the most part it's pretty stable in what we're using. And can you put solar on any type of roof? Like if someone was going to be upgrading their roof, can you put yeah. solar on a metal roof? Can you put solar on a shingle roof? A tile there roof? are there are very few exceptions. You can put them on slate tile roofs, uh, but the installation practice makes it somewhat impractical. Um, there are also tile metal roofs um, that due to the installation method, unless you do it in tandem to the roof being installed, from a practical perspective, you're adding weaknesses to a roof. So I advocate people stay away from it. Um, that being said, there are companies that do it and yeah, they do. <laughs> those are those really gorgeous roofs that cost like three times the price, the tile slayers. Yes. Yeah, there's a yes. few in the old city quarter in Nanaimo and they're gorgeous. They are gorgeous. And I don't know that I'd want to see, I love solar panels, but to put solar panels over a slate roof, I just... I don't know that I'd love that. Right. So um, have you fully been able to tell, tell us all of like how the assessment, like what if the panel is full? What happens then? Yeah. So I, I've ran into very few instances where your electrical panel is truly full. Um, if that's the case, you can add a sub panel, which we've done in various locations. Um, or one of the things kind of as Rick alluded to, there was some money for the loan, you can actually tie a service upgrade into the loan while you're getting solar. So I've upgraded 100 amp services to 200 amp and installed solar at the same time. So you can kind of circumvent some of those issues if they arise. I like you tried to tell me the other day that when you upgrade from 200 to 400 amp, you turn commercial. Is that accurate? No, you can maintain a 400 amp residential service okay. for hydro rates. Okay, very interesting. Um, Connie has a really good question. Um, what about feeding your solar to BC Hydro versus the battery pack? Yeah, so fortunately, we are actually quite lucky that BC Hydro has something called the net metering program. Okay. And because of that, that means when your house isn't using your solar power, it goes back into the grid and essentially spins your meter backwards and you get a credit like a power unit for power unit, kilowatt hour for kilowatt hour. And then when you need to use it, generally in the winter, you have it as a bank of credit to use. Fantastic. I had a client the other day tell me he had zero hydro bill for last year. Because it yep. was, yeah. So it took him two years to get there, but on year number two, um, and if he had more space on his roof, he would put more panels on because then he would get a check in the mail, he thinks. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is that actually a fact? Do they pay you? So yeah, the, the BC Utilities Commission said BC Hydro has to pay people. There is a caveat though. It is at production rate and production okay. rate is about, it's 46% of what tier one is. So okay. generally I don't advocate people produce much more power than they need because the return on investment just starts, starts to fall very quickly. Interesting. Um, so let's just reflect a little bit on when you came and did the solar consultation on my house. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I had for you was exactly like what Denise had was how long does it take to pay off this solar? If I was going to, you know, take advantage of one of these loan programs, typically what are we seeing? How long does it take? Yeah. So if I'm going to just throw an average, it's around 10 years on a smaller system, you're looking more in the eight year ballpark on a larger system, you can get up to 12, although that's a very large system, but it will all be site specific. You know, what type of tree coverage do you have? What slopes of roof do you have? You know, if you have a pure south facing roof, I've seen seven and a half year buybacks. Um, okay. Not super common, but they exist. And how long do these solar panels last for? So now that's an awesome question because the real answer is they're warranted from a production guarantee for 25 years, but solar panels exist that are 50 years old and they still function. Huh. I was on one of the remote islands and they had solar panels that were, they were 10 watt solar panels 
and they were still producing two watts effectively. So they were very old solar panels and they still functioned. I mean, your efficacy is going to drop year over year. But that being said, they're still going to continue to work. So even if we project based on those 25 years, there's nothing to say that at year 26, they stop working. They just continue on at a slightly lower efficacy. Okay, awesome. We're going to jump back to Rick and we're going to get Rick to talk a little bit more about how the homeowners access uh, the rebates available and what specific rebates are available between federal and provincial. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so let's just talk about the different types of rebates, first of all. So um, from, a, from the, like you say, Laura, there's, uh, there's, there's federal rebates, there's provincial rebates, and then there are some, if you're lucky, there are some mun municipal rebates as well. Um, um, now what's there's an what's the best place to start? Is it easiest to start at the municipal one because there's so few? <laughs> well, so the mun municipal ones, if you're lucky enough to live in a place where there is some municipal rebates, um, typically speaking, it's not, uh, uh, it, they run out through the year. So, so grab them quickly in January or whatever the sort of calendar cycle is for your municipality. Um, there's an excellent website, um, betterhomesbc.ca, um, which does a fabulous job of itemizing all of the rebates, the federal ones, the provincial ones, and the municipal ones. Um, so that's really, I would say, your first stop, um, your first port of call. If you're looking at rebates, go look at that website, betterhomesbc.ca, um, and, and you can see, uh, I think it's called the rebate search tool. You can see all of the rebates there. Um, uh, now, the actual, in terms, just to dig into those rebates a little bit, um, there are rebates for um, the, coming back to the, sort of the building envelope idea. Um, so there's rebates for better insulation, better insulation in your attic, insulation in your basement, for example, your crawl space. Um, there's rebates for doors and for windows. Um, there are rebates um, for even improving your air ceiling. So if you've got that that Swiss cheese house and it's a little bit less Swiss cheesy in the second assessment, then there's rebates to be had for that improvement because that really truly is going to save you energy. Um, and you, that, that's an interesting rebate because you, you, you're not buying anything, you're just going around and sort of addressing your building envelope a little bit, but there's up to a thousand dollars for um, simply um, fixing your air ceiling. Um, and then there's rebates for the, for the big exciting stuff too. So, um, rebates for heat pumps, rebates um, for solar panels as well. Um, that's the federal picture. If you're provincially, British Columbia is really investing in green energy. They're really trying to incentivize us as a collective to, um, uh, to um, sort of green our houses and be energy efficient. Um, and so there's a bunch of other, other rebates up to... Um, uh, up to five or six thousand dollars if you've got a natural gas furnace, for example, or a fossil fuel fired furnace, um, the oil, diesel, natural gas, and you pull that out and replace it with an energy efficient heat pump, um, then they'll give you up to six thousand dollars for that. And the, the the really interesting thing is you're out, you're able to sort of stack these rebates. So you can get some money from the province, you can get money from the feds, and you can even get loan money as well. So this is all um, really good incentives and you're sort of allowed to double dip in all of this. So depending on your situation, it can actually be really, really cost effective and quite cheap um, for, for, for particular, depending on your, your sort of setup right now to really um, or quite cost effective to upgrade your home. What's the most, uh, the largest amount of rebates you've seen a client get? Oh, uh, well, the, the, the largest, oh goodness, probably, um, whew, probably 12 or 13 grand, I think is in, in total, I think, um, that okay. there's, there are a lot of rebates. There's a low income, there's a, sorry, the last rebate, which is a provincial rebate to talk to is the income qualified rebate. Um, and that, um, can, can really help as well. That gives you another maybe $10,000 or something towards a heat pump. So, um, there really are some good rebates available. Wow. That's great. And how long do these rebates typically take to arrive back? Cause I know when the process yeah. we talked about, you know, you do your assessment, which with you, which is, 
which was like, I guess, what was that about $900? Is that how it worked out to be? Uh, yeah, yeah. Typically speaking, the assessment costs, um, well, the, the total sort of assessment costs is typically around um, uh, $1,100 for the, for the two assessments. Uh, okay. There is a rebate towards the cost of that as well. Um, doesn't okay. cover the whole thing, um, but there's a rebate um, uh, of, of about 50% of the cost of the assessments um, okay. in, in addition to all the other rebates. Um, but yeah, you're, you're, you're exactly right. There is a, there is a sort of um, a slight lag in some of the rebates. Um, so it's worth jumping into the details to understand just from a cash flow perspective um, how the rebates are going to work and that timing for the rebates. Um, because it, it, it typically speaking, not always, but typically speaking, the rebates come after the fact. Um, there are a couple of options for the rebates where you can actually um, have the government um, BC um, pay the vendor directly. Um, so you don't actually need to get too involved in the in the cash at all at that point. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. OK, um, I think we've got kind of a really interesting question, which maybe Bruce wants to jump in and take next, but you both are really passionate about educating clients and helping them be informed about their decisions of energy updates. What are some of like messages you want to share with, with us that you feel are really important? Yeah, well, I, I suppose for myself, one of them is that solar is accessible. Uh, you know, the federal government's made a huge commitment to making it cost effective for homeowners. I mean, with the, with the introduction of the loan, there is no one that couldn't put five kilowatts of solar on their house tomorrow, have the cost covered and have it paid off in under the loan term of, term of 10 years. So, you know, there's, everyone should, if they want to make something happen, they should start with that. That's simple and easy. Uh, I mean, this is crossing into Rick's territory a bit. I also advocate most people put a bit more insulation in your attic. There's almost no attic I've ever crawled around in that wouldn't benefit from a bit more blown in. Um, maybe not something I directly should be selling people on, but it's for me, that's no sense making power if it's just going right out the window. So Denise has a great question. Does five kilowatts make a difference? Yeah. So if you installed five kilowatts of solar on your house, um, on the average house, that would produce about 5.5 megawatt hours annually. Um, okay. BC Hydro states that the average household uses 10 megawatt hours. In my experience, that's a false number. Uh, I believe it's much closer to 15. They are the ones with the data, but anecdotally, I know that to be untrue. Um, so the average person could reduce their bill by approximately 40% because you end up cutting off the higher tier which costs more, so it's a higher savings, even though the total amount isn't the same. So if we reflect on my house where I met you, yep. um, I think my first comment was I use a lot of power. Yep. And so just speak to that because I thought, oh, I use a lot of power and you actually said, actually, you don't use as much as you think. Yeah, so well, and, and that's the very interesting thing because a lot of people, until you look at other people's power use, sometimes you don't appreciate how much power some people can really use. For instance, my, my new home I bought about a year ago uses about two and a half times more power than my previous home. Why is that? Because everything's, everything's electric and it's an old rancher. Oh, okay. So, so we've- So what uh, you're saying we, is you need Rick to come visit. We have been working on energy efficiency <laughs> upgrades like it's nobody's business since we moved in. Got it. Yeah, because- you know, I thought, well, because I'm in tier two a lot, um, because of the, you know, electric car charger, uh, you know, so the electric sauna, the hot tub, those kinds of things. I thought I use way more than I, you said I actually did, which I found really. Yeah. Amazing. And then, and then what did we figure out how long it would take me to pay off that solar? Cause you know, like say example, for example, like your scenario, you have a, a smaller rancher, which is what I predict I have. You know, there's only so much roof space. And there you did comment about a a ratio, like when it makes sense and when it doesn't make sense. If the roof's not big enough or the, the sun exposure's not big enough. That's I think yeah. something that 
I think people can be very afraid of when, you know, like you think, oh, I'm going to spend all this money, but what if I don't get my return? Yeah. Well, and fortunately, technology has done us a huge favor and modeling software is fantastic. So, you know, I can go to a site and even before I go to a site, I can use Google Images and Google Street View and we can see any obstructions that might be around your house. You say, oh, there's this tree here. Okay, well, let's model that. Let's see what it actually does. And then you might say, oh, it's a tree that actually loses its leaves. So you can do a couple projections. You can say, hey, when it's full, what's the effect it's going to have? And you, you can really find out how much power each individual site and each individual roof, even different roof slopes of the same roof can make. Oh, interesting. That makes complete sense. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Rick, what about you? The same question. Uh, what type of messaging do you feel is most important to share with our with our group today? Good. Um, yeah. So I think that uh, um, I, I had an interesting situation earlier today. One of my uh, I was talking with somebody about getting an energy assessment, and they were a bit worried about it because they thought they could fail it. Um, and it's like, well, what if my home's really bad? Like, I will I will I fail the energy assessment? I'm not going to get any rebates. That's not a thing. You can't. You, it's not a test. Um, you can't fail the assessment. Um, of course, that you know the the government in rebates is is about making us more efficient. Um, so so that's sort of a really important thing. Once you're signed up for the program, um, it's not pass or fail. You 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 sign up for the program and you're sort of in. You will get those rebates. Um, I, I guess the second thing just to say is the energy assessment. Um, uh, the results of the energy assessment will prioritize all of the upgrades. So, you know, there's a there's a sort of a, 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 a big list of upgrades potentially for your home. It could be windows, it could be a heat pump, could be what have you. Um, and so the, the critical thing is, well, where are you going to start? Now, you, you, you know, you can sort of say, OK, well, I, I just want my solar panels. Or I just want my heat pump. Um, and that's OK. What I like to do is just um, prioritize the assessments uh, maybe in terms of what's going to be the biggest bang for your buck, for example, or what will save the most energy or, or what will reduce your carbon emissions the most or what have you. Like we can we can itemize um, the, the if there's a few upgrades, we can itemize those upgrades um, based on different criteria. So you can say, hey, you know, what's what's going to give me the most energy savings? Um, for my for my dollar and that's a really important piece of the puzzle um, so that people can sort of it allows you to go through with your your home upgrades because this is about your home and your your choices you're making and big financial investments um, it just gives you a little extra piece of data a bit of a sort of a lens another lens with which you can look at the uh, at the various things you're thinking about is there a timeline on the greener home program from start to finish uh, it typically takes, um, yeah, good question. So the, I have seen people get through it in about six weeks. Um, that is by far from normal. Um, typically speaking, I would say think about a timeline of about six months. By the time you've got your assessment, um, you, you found your energy advisor, you've got your assessment, you've got your upgrades. Everybody is very busy. Typically speaking, that takes a few weeks or a couple of months perhaps. Um, and then you've got your assessment at the other end, and then finally you get your rebate. So, you know, certainly six months is kind of a realistic time frame. Sometimes th there's no there's no um, there's no minimum. Sorry, there's no maximum time to it. If you get your assessment and you're just going to take you a year or two years to get all of your work done, that's OK. The program's not going anywhere. Um, you can just chip away at it over a, a period of time. And then when you're finished, um, you get that second assessment, and that's when you can get your rebates. And do you also get a copy of an inner guide certificate? Because I know on our property disclosure statements um, in real estate, they ask us, what's your inner guide? This was one of Denise's questions. Yeah, absolutely you do. I, uh, I would say I should have one I could, I could show you. Um, you. You absolutely do get an inner guide certificate. Um, at the end, you get you get basically your your initial inner guide assessment certificate, and then once you're finished, you get another one at the end. Um, obviously, I would say uh, everyone should put it on their fridge and point to their friends and show how cool it is and say how much energy they sa they've saved. I'm not offended if they don't do that, but mine's on my fridge. 
That, that's uh, awesome. I will um maybe put mine in, in red with a red bow on it for my mom for Christmas. So if you don't mind, you can nice. send it over and I'll just, because, you know, they talk about their hydro bills. They talk about turning lights off. They talk yes. about how much money they save. They I monitor their app on BC Hydro. <laughs> I um, love it. It's fantastic. <laughs> Dinner conversations will no longer be the same. It's like, no, no, don't turn the heat up. That'll, you know. So, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, because it's a real thing. When you go from being full-time work to like sub, like basically what my dad calls his pension living class, you know, and you know, you know, they're say they're in their early 70s. They care about the dollars and cents. So they've actually taken advantage of on their home of almost all the energy guide. I think like, is it is it common to see someone go to the extreme that my fa my family went to on a home? Because I think my dad took out windows that I thought were completely decent. Yeah, they are the, the they're my favorite customers. They get the, at the end of the day, there's there's no per, per se value in it. For me, I want to have people build and make their homes really efficient. And that's what sort of fills up my cup. And so your your folks were just absolutely they went to town and that's really what makes me excited and happy when I get to go back and do someone's assessment and they've done all of their upgrades uh and we see a big difference between the before and after uh it's very cool it's very exciting and what is a big difference on an inner guide score oh good question so maybe an average um maybe an average house let's say would be hypothetically uh 80 gigajoules um uh now what's gigajoule we can we can kind of get into the into the numbers of it but but roughly speaking you might get a score of about 80 initially um and there are homes that are worse than that typically speaking after an assessment you would be looking at depending on the upgrades maybe reducing that by a third um so you could save I, I think over the, the span of all of my customers, they've saved, roughly speaking, about 34% of their energy consumption. Um, I'm a bit of a numbers geek. I track all this stuff. Um, so I actually know it's exactly 34% across all of my customers. Interesting. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I'd love to open up our chat to any questions that anyone in our call has. Uh, we've got both the basically captive audience of both Bruce and Rick for a few more minutes. And I'm really excited that we've like in grateful we've had you both on the call. So if there's anything we're missing, um, Bruce, feel free to jump in. If there's any other pieces of words of wisdom or steps in the process that would help homeowners. Yeah, feel free to jump in and let us know. Connie or Denise, I'd love to have your input. So um, I know I know in my experience, it seemed a bit daunting because it seemed like everything I was starting was a lot of money. So, but I'm really pleased to know that, um, and I learned something new tonight. I didn't know that there, there was a rebate um, el eligible on the energy audit assessment. So that's pretty cool. Right. So obviously, it shows that I should pay more closer attention to the link you sent me in the email. <laughs> So one the, one interesting thing that I often see, and and I, I'm the I, I'm sort of I'm the building envelope guy. I, I absolutely advocate for improving building envelopes. And, and what I've seen is that if you if you do um, if you're thinking about um, getting a heat pump, particularly um, if you tighten up your building envelope, get that extra insulation, take care of that terrible single pane window down in the basement, those sort of little upgrades that actually can save you money, not just from an energy perspective, but it can, um, oftentimes I see my homeowners are able to get a smaller heat pump, um, particularly because a lot of people are talking about heat pumps or maybe um, uh, they're able to get a smaller heat pump by doing some other upgrades, as you said um, initially, like that's gonna be a bit cheaper and can fund those upgrades. Um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important sort of piece of the puzzle here that, and you get your building envelope get um, working really well and then fill up, fill your house with cheap heat. Um, that's sort of a really good way of thinking about it. So to recap, step one, call you. Step two, <laughs> really think about, you know, what those upgrades are that make the building envelope, you know, fully running as efficiently as possible. And then, you know, 
go through the the links for the rebates depending on how that all plays out depending yeah. on what your assessment says yeah absolutely uh, uh, absolutely and and to denise's question there um yeah this isn't just about energy savings um this is about um building a comfortable home a comfortable environment um and 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 we can even during the assessment get down to like well do you have any cold patches in your house like is there um, that you, you know oftentimes all well, that room above the garage is really chilly and and we have to have extra heating in there and we sort of shut the door in the winter and it's freezing cold in there and you know we can get really localized and get really specific about okay well what's going on in this particular piece of the house um, maybe it's sort of uh, sort of a bit isolated or um, there's a there's a giant hole in the drywall or something who knows um, but we can get really specific and sort of diagnose questions um, particularly cold patches in in people's homes as well, which is kind of cool. That is very cool. Bruce, anything to add to it? Any preparation someone should be doing if they're thinking about putting solar on their home, other than making sure their roof's not too old? Yeah, well, often it's a silly thing, but often I get into people's houses immediately after they've done a renovation, where they've gone from their electrical panel to their roof, if you're going to, it'd be great if you ran a wire for solar. That forward thinking helps a lot of people because I don't know why, but in this year alone, I've done five where people are like, oh, I did a kitchen reno. And I was like, oh, so this, this wall over here was open. Well, yeah. So a little bit of forward thought always helps. Um, I also like to point out to people that the mere act of putting solar on your house increases the value of your house. So let alone it will pay itself off and do all those things. You've already added the money into your home. You know, whatever you're going to put into it, I know is value added to your house. You know, what that you idea mean? of, pardon me? Sorry about that. Extent? Didn't mean to interrupt you, Bruce. What do you think the value would increase by, by putting solar panels? I like to assume it's closer to a 50% dollar for dollar increase. I've heard it quoted that it was higher, but my gut tells me that there will be the majority of people will see that and say, oh, wonderful, I don't have to pay for solar panels. But there has to be someone that says, oh, I don't know anything about solar panels, that makes me nervous. So I just can't think it's a one-to-one, -one, but I have to believe that the average person would see that as a value add to your home. Well, especially when, you know, if you think of the common scenario where a homeowner will ask, what are the hydro averages? And when the hydro averages come in predominantly almost in, like in the negative or very low, then they say, well, actually due to this, and if you can show the pattern, that part I find really intriguing because I'm wondering if we have enough data yet to support how the, like in real estate, there's so so few homes that we're selling that have mm -hmm. panels on them. So it'd be really intriguing to see. Denise, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, um, so Bruce, uh, I know with solar, it runs into a battery situation, correct? So you're gathering the, the energy from the sun, it goes into a battery, and then that's stored, and then you use it from there. Is that correct? Not necessarily. So you can have batteries with solar, but because of the net metering application uh, for BC Hydro, you can just feed it right back into the grid. So the okay. hydro would function as your battery. Um, that being said, that means if the power goes out, your solar doesn't work as a safety precaution for BC Hydro. Gotcha. When, would be, when when would it be beneficial to do a battery like option versus feeding back into the grid? Generally, that's going to be if your power is out for long periods of time, and I'm talking in this instance days. So I, I've done it where somebody was, you know, the average would be once a year they'd lose power for four days, and they said I want to have a battery backup capability with my solar so that I can run this fridge, and that was that was their only hope. They said, I want to run this fridge. It, you know, we put on their internet and a bunch of other stuff. And they're like, if all goes awry, I would like to be able to power this fridge. So if you're thinking from an electrical background, if someone calls you and asks you to wire a generator, how would that, I know it's not green energy, but how would that differentiate between the two? Because I mean, many of us are not losing our power, luckily at this point for four days at a time, mm -hmm. but when that, like if you did the cost conversion between powering back into the grid for the majority of the 360 days of the year versus, you know? Yeah, well, and right now it's 
for the average person, putting in a small generator panel makes a lot of sense. Batteries are still at a point and the technology is still advancing so quickly. They're expensive. I mean, if, if funds aren't an issue and you don't want to listen to a generator, wonderful. Batteries, you'll be very happy with them. But for the average person, having a small generator that's going to allow you to power those essential loads is where I'm seeing the majority of the market go. Well, Rick is commenting that there are rebates for the batteries, which is great. I uh, Have you had that many clients take advantage of that, Bruce? Um, are there rebates in exclusion to the greener homes? Because I've only had people use the solar photovoltaic because I know you can use a resiliency measure is what it's called for the batteries. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's the resiliency yeah. measure, yes. So I've, I've had no one just use that because they always end up using the solar for, because That's you can right. claim the total amount and doing the batteries. So, yeah. you know, for the $40,000, you can put in a fairly nice solar array and battery backup. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, you can, uh, you have to you pair it with another upgrade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really cool. The, the technology is ever evolving. It's pretty cool. Well, go ahead, Denise. I just can't stop asking questions. Um, Bruce, so if you had a roof um, that needed to be replaced in, say, five to seven years, would you recommend expediting that replacement before you put the um, solar panels on? Or would you put them on and then just take them off and replace your roof when it needed to be done? It would depend the style of roof and the roof pitch. If this was a, if we're talking a two or a three twelve roof, something very simple, you'd be fine. You can do it. Um, I, I always have worries that if a roof is already that old, working on it isn't a great idea. Um, you have to be very careful about working on roofs that have already been aged or damaged in any other way. So, I mean, the time of the year we're going to work on it's going to be selective. Um, there are lots of parts of the summer where you think it would be great to install on roofs that we're not going to work on. So in a general standpoint, I'd say either expedite doing the roof or hold off on the solar. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but there, there are niche instances where I, I would concede that I would do it. Um, but that would not be the norm. Thank you. Hey, go ahead, Connie. Um, so Bruce, you mentioned that there is like the sun filtering, so where you can actually light light filtering where the, the solar panels come through. I'm thinking decks. So yep. I'm thinking if you were to cover, say, a deck that's like, let's say eight by 12 or something like that. Okay. Do something like that with some sort of solar panel cover that lets light through. What, what would your return be on that? Like what kind of energy would you be able to get from that? If you had a good Southern exposure, let's just say all the good things. Okay. So if we were good Southern exposure and we were to make it simple, I'm going to say that it's 10 feet wide because that's three panels wide. And that would be approximately 12 feet long. That is only six panels. So that's two and a half kilowatts installed. So that's two and a bit megawatt hours annually. Okay. Um, if we put that into tier two costs, that would be about $370 annually would be the return on those panels. Okay. That was very quick math off the top of my head. So please apologize. Thank you. <laughs> Got a question from Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, a buddy of mine was over recently and he has solar panels. He's in Edmonton. Um, he was saying that if you get an inverter and you have an electric car, you can use your electric car to store power. Is that, so, have you heard of something like that, Bruce? Does that make any sense? Like if. Yeah. So, um, Bi-directional chargers allow for that. Um, okay. The only issue with it becomes you need a bit more technology in line with it because you're going to need an automatic transfer switch uh, to make sure that you can't backfeed mm. via your car when the power's out. Um, that being said, like the Ford Lightning has that capability. I want to say at one point 
they were advertising bolts, like new bolts would have the capability that you would need a certain type of charger. I have never personally done one. Um, I know someone with the Ford Lightning and they're working through the Ford network at getting it serviced because it has to be a Ford technician. Um, but that's something I've been very interested in as I have two electric vehicles. So mm. I thought that would be neat myself. Mm. And I guess part of the question is what would the, what would even the relevance be? What would be the application? It's just, I guess in the. So it's generally just for power outages. It just gives yeah. you, okay. you can use your vehicle as a battery and I think there are lots of times where that would be super neat. Mm -hmm. um, for us right now, it's not nearly as appealing because we don't have time of use energy charges. Um, but if we are anything like the rest of the world, sooner or later we will. And then you can use batteries as a form of energy arbitrage. So with the power that you have, when it's really expensive, use your batteries. And then when it's cheap, you just charge them up with the cheap power so you can make a bit of money differential there. Mm, okay. Kind of how um, which will be cars are charged, right? If you set your your scheduling of your electric car to charge at eleven o'clock or midnight through to seven a.m., the rate is de is lower tier. So the it, cars automatically prompt you to charge when the energy is lower overnight. Exactly. So yeah. when when we come to that, because come my on. capitalist instinct tells me we will, all of a sudden <laughs> those type of things and even home batteries will start to have a different financial case. That's BC, really Hydro is, uh, BC Hydro is actually undertaking some uh, trials for time of use billing. Um, one of my homeowners is involved in the, um, has been selected for that trial period. So I, I think it it's coming. Um, and so to, to Peter, to your question about the relevance, I think that, you know, being able to bank cheap electricity or, or, or cheaper electricity in your car during those, uh, um, th those sort of more expensive times um, would be quite beneficial, as Bruce is saying. Really interesting. I wonder what we'll see our hydro costs become. It's not going to go down. <laughs> yeah. What what goes what starts one direction doesn't go the other, unless, unless you energy do an energy assessment and put solar, then you might you know go uh, yeah. down dramatically. <laughs> well. Um, do we have any other questions before we wrap up? I really want to thank both Bruce Moss from Sun Solar and Rick from, from Energy. Oh, I screwed up your last name. Uh, Rick Martin from Energy View. Thanks, Rick. I should know that better. Um, <laughs> we have, we did, like, you know, spend almost three hours together, right? Yeah. yeah. Do we have any other questions before we let the our two wonderful speakers for the day go? Okay, well, I really appreciate everyone attending and I couldn't have done this without my fantastic hosts and without the very organized Crystal Lee. So thank you. And I we look forward to next month's session, which we're gonna change the topic a little bit. And our next month's topic is going to be all on tips and tricks for having a non-stressful holiday season in the kitchen. So Luke Griffin with Chef's course will be on our next thing talking about some really fantastic ways to not only save money when cooking for the kids like cooking a large Christmas meal but also to bring some joy to it and he's going to share some really cool uh, ways to make Christmas really spectacular so we're pretty excited thanks for coming everyone really appreciate it thanks so much yeah, have a wonderful evening yeah bye 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 everyone thank you